Hello and welcome back to the IPA Book Club. Today we are talking about Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, a classic novel, one that I very, very much enjoyed. And we're going to have a great discussion today with the IPA's very own Chetna Bahadik. Welcome to the studio. I think this is the first appearance you've had on our digital content. Yes. Excellent. All right. Beautiful. We'll go easy on you today. So. Firstly, I loved this book. Uh, when I was asked, I, 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 it's taken me a while longer than it should have. Um, I guess I thought it'd be, for lack of a better way to put it, uh, chick lit from the 1800s, but I really, really th- uh, enjoyed it and I can see why it's gone on. I mean, as we were talking about before we started, uh, I think it's a huge, if nothing else, influence on the modern day rom-com. But I mean, it's a very old book. It was written in the early 1800s. Uh, why do you think... Pride and Prejudice has remained relevant and had such a following for that long. Pride and Prejudice, I mean, yes, it it was written in 1815. Mm. But if we look at what it is about, it's really about how do you find your partner mm. in life? Mm. And uh, that question is still relevant to all the young people and just about everybody, I think, around the world. How do you find your partner in life? Because mm. if it wasn't, then Married at First Sight, which is, you know, a reality TV show, it just wouldn't be as popular as it is. Yeah. Because, and, and you know, it is really about finding someone for a long-term relationship. It's mm. not just about finding a dating partner. Mm. And if you look at Married at First Sight, what it's really trying to do is, it's really, yes, the looks are a part of it. How do these people look? But it really is trying to understand how they behave. Mm. They look at, um, are they lying? Uh, are they considerate towards their partner? Yeah. How do they relate to people around them? Mm. And yes, it's done in a very sort of um, reality TV way. Mm. But the reason why people are engaging with it is because they're all trying to see like, oh, will he make a good partner? Does she make a good partner? What makes a good partner? Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what Pride and Prejudice does, yeah. except that you don't have to, you know, feel that sort of guilty pleasure about it. It is just Pride and Prejudice. It's I don't feel guilty well when I watch book. Married at First Sight. That's, oh, well. But it, it, it's an interesting point, though, because this was written at a time when the paperback novel novels were, uh, you know, one of the moral panics we see often today. Oh, it's rotting young people's minds. They should spend time studying, less time reading novels. I mean, it was a, it was a, a medium of enjoyment hmm. more than, I suppose, it didn't have the literary tradition and the literary analysis that we apply to it uh, mm-hmm. today. Why do you think it was so engaging back then, uh, particularly for young women? I think that it relates to the world that um, hmm. Jane Austen is talking about. Yeah. It's a very respectable, a very gentle yeah. world. It's very uh, genteel, I think, is the word that they would use. It's mm. very respectable. Mm. They're talking about very respectable middle class people, mm. you know, and how they live and just their, you know, all the interconnected relationships within the community. Mm. How does this family operate within the village yeah. and, you know, what their aspirations are. Mm. And in some ways it's quite simple because it doesn't have like, yes, there's a war happening mm. somewhere, yeah. you know, because there's the military and stuff. And yeah, all the these militias are, yeah, exactly. uh, stationed, yeah. But they don't really refer to it. Mm. It really is very sort of located in the domestic sphere of women. Yeah. You right. know, their relationship, uh, the Bennets then visit the Lucases and what Charlotte and Lizzie talk about and the, the balls that are happening, the dinners that are happening. But is that so different from today? I mean, we, we have the equivalent today. We have the, the ideas of respectability or is the idea of respectability being uh, sort of cancelled? Oh, and what is respectability? What makes somebody respectable? I think that's a... a, a I think, a, yes, I think that's a, that's a really interesting question. And I do think that if you look at Pride and Prejudice, it definitely, it's quite definite in talking about that there is something called respectability. Uh, does it? I don't, I don't know. It, it, to me, it seems uh, to ask questions, particularly of, of men in the novel, well, men and women in the novel, yeah. um, but... You know, what is respectability? Is respectability somebody like Mr. Wickham, who has impeccable manners and is very charming? Or is it somebody like Mr. Darcy, who, uh, you know, is redeemed at the end as a character, but is not respectable? Yes. Or when it came from a respectable family. family. But it was also that, I mean, I'm looking at it from the women's perspective, Mm. and you are from the men, which which is good. Good. But, like, you know, if you look at Mr. Darcy and Mr. Wickham, Mm. um, 
they are both trying to present themselves as... Uh, Mr. Bingham. Sorry. Mr. Bingley, rather. Mr. Bingley. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Bingley and Mr. Darcy, they are both... I mean, it's assumed that they are respectable because mm. of their background. Mm. Uh, whereas Wickham has to prove himself to be, whether he is or he's not, which actually he isn't at the end, yeah. because his actions determine that. But, it, but people assumed he was so people, much more respectable. Yes. They assume he was because of the way he carried himself, the way he talked, the way he interacted. Mr. Yeah. Darcy was very respectable, mm. but on the other hand, the way he conducted himself just alienated everyone. Yeah, uh, and uh, I mean, I guess that t touches on the, the title of the novel, pr The Prejudice Part of It. What do we learn about prejudice, especially oh. when it comes to respectability, picking a mate, a partner, family? So, like, when we look at it just from, you know, Pride and Prejudice's perspective, mm. um, Elizabeth, so Mr. Darcy develops a prejudice against the Bennett family or mm. against even, like, you know, his, his fascination for Elizabeth because of how he sees the mother behave. Yeah. And, and he, he and builds a whole sisters. picture of everything his life is going to be based on what he... Uh, sees of the mother and the sisters behave. And you, there is definitely an element of prejudice in it, mm, mm. you know, because he's judging Lizzie mm. on the actions of the family. And, and, and there's an element of pride too. Because Lizzie's pride is hurt. It, uh, his, his, pride, her, his pride, yes. Her pride is hurt, but he, during his long soliloquy, uh, sort of around the middle of the novel where he proposes to Elizabeth, he does say it was my own terrible pride that prevented me from, uh, you know, admitting my feelings for you and everything else. I mean, what, what does the novel well, say? It was the world's worst proposal. Yeah, it was too. <laughs> because he says that, you know, it's against all my good sense yeah. and everything that is telling me that I shouldn't be doing this, I'm still doing it. So why do we like him at the end then? Why do we feel sympathy for Mr. Darcy? I think we do because he does something, because, you know, he takes criticism on board. Mm. And I do think that that is something in the book that I think if there's anything truly to be learned from Pride and Prejudice, mm. it is that people who tell you what you want to hear mm. are not necessarily your friends, yeah, you, like Mr. Wickham. Right, so you, you mentioned that a bit, bit to me. Elaborate on, on that. Yeah, so Mr. Wickham, he kind of figures... Lizzie out pretty quickly, mm. what she likes, what she doesn't like. And he feeds that, mm. Mm. you know, and Lizzie likes him. Yeah. You know, she's she's sort of hoping for a romance with him, which doesn't transpire because she's not rich enough. No. And uh, But with Mr. Darcy, she develops a prejudice pretty quickly because he doesn't... Uh, you know, I mean, he insults her at the start. Yeah. He insults but, her. But he, he, there's an authenticity there. I think that might explain why towards the end, and, and there's depth there. No, but I, I think that, you know, Lizzie's character emerges mm. from the way she responds to the letter she receives mm. from Mr. Wickham, which is very critical. Mm, mm. It, you know, it talks about her family. It talks about her conduct. It talks about Jane. But the fact that she, uh, you know, when she first reads it, she's just so annoyed. Mm. But then she reads it again. Mm. And then she thinks about it. Mm. And she actually then takes that criticism on board and decides to actually both modify her own behavior, yeah. but also then go and try and talk to her family about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, she takes criticism on, on board and that's very hard. Mm. Yeah. No. You know, and, and probably Mr. Darcy does the same mm. and that's where their true character emerges. Right. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to contrast the novel with somebody who doesn't take uh, criticism well or doesn't hear it at all because... Uh, if that's the point that the novel's trying to make, there has to be a, a counterpoint and a counterbalance. Is it I, Mr. Collins? Is it... Uh, um, I mean, that's, I mean that's in, I'll... In, in the novel itself, probably it would be hard to find. But I think that if you look at popular culture around today and the way the whole, uh, you know, debate around women's rights is done, for example, mm. you can't say anything without... You know, just the fact that you criticize yeah. is all that matters. Yeah, yeah. Not whether the criticism has merit. So, uh, so I do think that that is something that needs to be just talked about more. Mm. That how to take criticism and for how for women to take criticism sometimes. Well, yeah, um, but it, it, it raises questions about, uh, I, I guess, and this is an IPA podcast, not a, uh, you know, university uh, student union uh, podcast. So I hesitate to bring this up, but the idea of the patriarchy, the idea of patriarchal or I guess paternalistic expectations from from women, I, I'm, I'm fascinated with the 
reaction to Lydia running off with somebody she wasn't married to. Now, obviously, this was a different time in the 1800s. Uh, it really wasn't the done thing then. But all the same now, uh, what we've had, we have this conversation about slut shaming and and the idea, the, the repression of. I mean, what, what's the hang up with women's sexuality that we've had? I don't think the problem in and does that novel- really affect respectability? Well, obviously, it does in the novel. In the novel, it does. But is it Lydia's sexuality that is a problem, or is it Lydia's poor judgment that is that is really yeah. called into question here? Mm. I mean, obviously, they didn't have a problem with sexuality because, you know, these men and women were meeting Hmm. and, you know, they were being encouraged to meet each other because they were hoping that they'll find a partner. Hmm. So, you know, it was definitely... How did they get married, though? Yes, yes, get married. But, you know, I mean, I think Lydia's... The real criticism was that Lydia was not engaging in good company, Mm. whether that's books, whether that is the people she's with, um, whether what she actually likes doing the most, Mm. how she perceives people, what she judges them on. Mm. And that has a real impact on her life outcome, Mm. if you Mm. think about it. Yeah, it does. So I think that it was less about sexuality, but more about judgment. Sure. But I mean, nobody had, nobody had a go at Charlotte Lucas for running, for marrying Mr. Collins. And yes, probably a probably a slightly more but, respectable. But you know, but you, this whole novel is from the perspective of Elizabeth, and Elizabeth does not agree with the decision. Yeah, and she sees it for what it is that you know she has made a poor choice. Mm, mm. Well, I mean, is Charlotte unhappy though, or is she is she at least as unhappy as Lydia expected uh, Lydia as Elizabeth expected her to be? Yes, but the, from the author's perspective, mm. there is definitely a criticism there. Mm. She pro- they probably, you know, she leaves it hanging, which is, I think, a good thing to do. Mm. Because really, uh, who's to decide if your grand romance uh, ends up with, you know, you ending up with someone like Wickham? Mm. Is that worth it? Or is uh, a completely romanceless marriage that Charlotte is in because mm. she doesn't really think that much of her husband. But on the other hand, she's well taken care of. Yeah. You know, so is that a bad decision? And I think that in the novel, certainly as far as Charlotte's concerned, this question is raised. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Because, you know, she makes a sensible choice. You don't want to criticize sensible, a sensible choice, you know, as, as if, you know, it has no merit. Yeah. But on the other hand, just by raising that question mm. that is this what she, what is the best that a woman can get? Mm. You know, I do can think that, Can women have it yeah. all, that eternal question? Can anybody have it all? Well, apparently, according to the novel, Elizabeth did get it all. That's true. That's true. She did. So <laughs> but that, I think that it's an aspirational novel for that. And, and you know, that's why we... So I guess that, that's the, the enduring... Uh, the enduring uh, appeal of the novel. Can yes. we all find our uh, Mr. Darcy or uh, I think it Elizabeth, is. as the case may be? I think it is, but uh, when I mean, you know, you can you can do a very literary uh, interpretation of the book and say that you know, oh, all women they should then look out for Mr. Darcy, mm. or that women should develop a healthy attitude towards romance mm. as well as being sensible. Yeah, that healthy attitude. So one observation you sort of made to me offline is that the marriage was. A very practical consideration then, and it was. I mean, the novel, it, 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 and, it, and it was a different time. There were yeah. economic considerations to be taken into it. Yeah. Uh, again, the respectability of families and so on. Yeah. Uh, so we saw the contrast between Lydia and Charlotte, and Charlotte making a highly practical decision, Lydia making a highly impractical decision. She's the one that's called out for being a harlot and all sorts of other things. Mm. Um, do you think we expect too much of marriage these days in terms of? The romantic aspect of it. Hmm. Have we gained? I mean, I, I think that's a a, a a reason for the high divorce rate, among other things. We expect too much of marriage. We expect it to be this eternal romance, whereas that's not necessarily the way life is. You know, love fades, love or love changes as it goes on. It becomes more of a a settled sort of thing. Uh, but I feel like people are, are but I think it cutting to- and running when when the very dust dries up. Yes, but is that what Pride and Prejudice is exploring. I think it is what it's really exploring is the dating scene. And if we have to compare dating scene back then to dating scene right now, Mm. um, I think that 
probably what we have lost is this sense of if you if you look at these women there are a lot of people looking out for them mm. and they have they have some they feel some responsibility towards the choices these women are going to make mm. And not so much anymore. I don't think so. I mean, have you seen the documentary to Tinder Swindler? Yeah, yeah, of yeah, course, of course, yeah. right. So you look at these women; they are finding the men they, that they are online, mm. and they're just basically they have to make all the decisions. Mm. You know, they are not consulting anyone, and there's absolutely nobody around them who can give them good advice. Yeah. You know, and they're getting scammed. And well, they're running off with Mr. Wickens. They are all running off with Mr. Wickens. In fact, if you see, I don't know if you know of Rob Henderson. Mm. Rob Henderson, he is this. Um, he's an academic mm. at Cambridge, and he's studying internet dating scene. Mm. And um, I mean, he's brilliant. And uh, I was listening to this discussion that he had with Jordan Peterson yeah. about what's happening with these dating apps. And it's awful. Mm. It's really the only winners is a very small group of psychopathic men mm. who know yeah, exactly to how to play. Yeah. yeah, who know exactly how to play the whole thing. And certainly, women are losers. And I don't know. certainly, well, you know, most men are losers on those dating apps. Um, oh well, I'd say there's somebody who was on there for you know up, up until I met my. Uh, in fact, I met my. Wife from a dating app, but that's a slightly different story because yeah. she recognised me from a photo her mother had sent her because I met her mother at a function. The mother. Yeah, but that, yeah. that's that's the thing. I mean, I think there's something in arranged marriages because oh. again, expectations. They're not, they're not that they're low, but there is expected. You know, love grows over time. Yes, and it's very different from an impulsive sort of a Lydia type I arrangement. I mean, you know, one of the most interesting things for me about Pride and Prejudice is that before I even knew Pride and Prejudice existed, mm. it was actually adapted for a television series in India where I grew up. All right. And my mother loved it. Yeah. She was watching it and she was just like, "This is." And you know, I'm a family of three girls, mm. and my mother was just like, "Oh, look was at she this." Mrs. Bennett? <laughs> she was. I mean, she was imagining herself. Uh, yeah. She's way too sensible yeah. <laughs> to really think of herself. But you know, just this question of, you know, first the thing that you've got. Daughters that you want to see marry well, mm. and secondly, how do you find this person who will, who's respectable, who is, uh, you know, who can look after himself and yeah. and, well, and the and the family, correct? You know, who has a person of means, so to speak. Yeah. So and you know, what is the role of the mother? How pushy can you really be? Yeah. And you know, when you ba- when do you back off? Mm. Mm. So it was interesting enough for her to, and she does. She's she's not like she's not a novel reader. Her English is sort of scratchy, mm. but she completely connected with the 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 television the series. The television series, yeah. Well, and that, then I read it later, mm. and then again I could completely relate with that scenario mm. because yes, I mean in India arranged marriages was certainly the norm, and even now is, and ev- definitely you know the but family is very involved. Right? It's much lower than it is in the yeah. Western world. No, 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 there's, there may be an element of coercion yes. there or, or loss yes, of Yes, but agency. even otherwise, I think that it is. It ha- definitely has to do with the fact that, you know, a lot of th- other things are taken into consideration when you're looking, when, you know, the family looks for the partner. Yeah. Then it is when just the woman or the man is looking for a partner. Mm. And, you know, definitely when it is just the woman. Mm. Because they are looking at things like, is there, is there, um, you know, cultural familiarity yeah. between them. Is is this person going to be, you know, like I said, would he be able to look after his family or yeah. not? And then again, that question of respectability, you know, mm. is this person a cad, mm. you know, or is this person to be trusted? Mm. Maybe respectability and, has to do with trust. And, and your parents are often in a, b- a better position to determine that because Those, they're older, they have judgment. Yes, they have judgment. And I mean, even in the book, that is what, you know, where they say, you know, the only real criticism of Mr. Bennett is that he didn't pay enough attention mm. to what was going on with his children. Mm. You what know, do you and think of Mr. Bennett? Meeting? He's my favourite character. I, I like his him. He sits in his library him. and tells people to piss off. <laughs> I know. He's fantastic. Yeah, That's the kind I mean, of father I want to be one day. <laughs> Leave me alone. I'm reading. Yes, but you know, he makes a very poor judgment in marrying the woman that he does. Mm. And that also comes out in the book. Was you Mrs. Know, Bennett like, that bad? I mean, she was a bit, bit. Uh, she was ditzy. A bit overbearing, but she was, she was ditzy, and I mean, clearly, her husband had completely lost interest <laughs> in her, um, 
you know, in conversation with her. Yeah. You, could, you know, he would, he would take, yes, he, he dealt with it with dark humor, mm. but he definitely had no respect for her intelligence. No. And so that was not necessarily a great marriage. No. And, you know, I mean, I, I think that they make that, make that clear. Yeah, yeah I guess, I guess so. All right, look, going back to what you mentioned about, about your mother watching the miniseries and, and, and being in India and everything, there would be people galore. Universities are filled to the brim hmm. with people who will say, oh, Pride and Prejudice, I mean, it's so old and so it's such patri- patriarchal undertones uh, and it's so white. Uh, you know, this is, there's nothing in here for anybody except old white men. As a woman of colour, a young woman of colour, I, I, I hasten to add, um, you know, wh- why are they wrong? Why is this transcended cultural boundaries? What does it say about the human condition? <laughs> well... Like I said, when we started, this is really about trying to find uh, the person to spend your life with. And, you know, whether you're in India, whether you're in the US, whether you're in the UK, mm. it still applies. And it's it's funny and it's about family. It's about community. It's mm. about friendship. Yeah. So, you know, these sort of ideas, they just transcend and they don't dramatically change across cultures. Mm. I mean, might sometimes, but you know those. But largely, for most people, they well, remain the same. I think culturally, how we deal in a society with these issues changes. But the human need for companionship, for love, yes. uh, to the, the maternal instinct and to the family instinct. Yes, I mean these things are are universal. They are universal. Yeah. So it's it, and I, I and and again, you know, there are plenty of differences in the novel between how we deal with things today. But that's the, that's the point of literature, to say things about the human condition and to transport you to other worlds and other time frames where you can learn, univ- again, about the human yeah. condition. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why it's considered a classic is because it transcends time. Mm. Mm. You know, it is going to remain, it, it, it manages to capture something that remains relevant mm. at any time. I think one of the reasons the final or the ending, the happy ending occurred in the way that it did was that, Darcy was challenged by Elizabeth. Yes. And I think Elizabeth was challenged by Darcy. Yes. Is that what we want? A challenge or? I think that's a great way to put it. Yeah. Because I think that uh, that implies that both will grow. Mm. You know, I think that that is what was wrong with the Collins's marriage or even the Bennett marriage. Yeah. That, you know, because... Uh, because it was not the right match, mm. neither of those people would be challenged to grow differently. Mm. You know, whereas I feel because Elizabeth and Darcy are well matched, mm. they will always, yes, like you said, they will always challenge each other to become a better self of themselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, definitely Elizabeth would point out if there was something to be pointed out mm. uh, in Darcy's Correct. behavior. And Darcy doesn't get that very often. He's got people like Miss Bingley. Exactly. Who just, just f- fade him. And it, either people love, or, love him or hate him. Whereas Elizabeth hated him initially. Yeah. But there was something there. I don't know. And again, she, uh, and again, he challenged her. Yeah, he definitely challenged her. He challenged her. And I mean, the other, I mean, Wickham and, and company were challenged in so far as the, the pursuit goes. Hmm. But there but was he, there was no authenticity there. There was nothing to. I, I feel like the most important thing that I think Jane Austen gets right is hmm. that she is looking at the character of a person. Hmm. Like, and you know, that's not just Elizabeth and Darcy. Even if you're looking at Kitty, who's really a marginal character, yeah. her character is very defined. Hmm. She is someone who will follow other people. Mm. You know, if if Lydia has influence on her, she will act like Lydia. Yeah. But if she has a more sensible influence on her, she will do she will act like that. Or like uh, Charlotte, you mm. know, even she's almost too sensible to yeah. the extent that, you know, she lacks that that romance that somehow yeah. that, that that effervescence that yeah. you know that makes a good personality. Mm. So or Mr. Bennett, even he he he's very well, you really understand who he is beyond just the surface. Mm. So even with marginal characters, she's able to draw out the, you know, yeah, the yeah like the character. Like, how do you define character? How, well, how do you define? What does the novel say about character? Again, the t- it's there in the title, Pride and Prejudice. Uh, somebody prideful like Mr. Darcy, somebody prejudiced like uh, Elizabeth was initially. 
I guess it's the old don't judge a book by its cover cliche. I mean, it, 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 it's character that matters. But it anything. is character that matters because the character in each of those cases, their life outcomes eventually depended on their character. Mm. And by, maybe by character, what we mean is how do you deal with situations yeah. and how do you respond to situations? Mm. And, you know, eventually Elizabeth and Darcy, they respond to the challenges of their life mm. um, with, with grace, mm. with... Uh, with strength, mm. you know, and they were able to be self-critical yeah. and make changes, yeah. and that and that maturity, as maturity, well. and that's what, and then their life outcomes reflect that. Mm. Yeah. Whereas the life outcome of Luke of of Charlotte reflects her character, her character which is which is you know practicality yeah. and sensible, but something is missing there. Mm. And mm. even you know she may or may not acknowledge it, but it's missing there. Yeah, yeah, correct. I, I think, I mean, talking about growth, I, I think we see a lot of growth in Mr. Darcy throughout the novel. Yes. And at the at, at, at the start, he's bombastic, a little bit arrogant, uh, aloof, um, prideful. Yeah. Towards the end, the, there's not there's references galore to how um, how pleasant he is, how polite, and everything else. Why? Why do you think that is? Do you think he? Do you think it was? Fundamentally of good character all along, just a little bit misunderstood, or do you think he grew? I know he was definitely not misunderstood. What he realized is that it's just not enough uh, to be good, to believe, like, you know, to be good, but not be considerate. Mm. What he learned was to be considerate. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that, he, that how he treats people around him, mm. that, you know, yes, he may not feel uh, like talking to someone at a, uh, you know, at a ball that he is at, or it might be an effort for him, mm. but that effort is worth making. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. You know, yeah. and he does, I mean, you know, to the extent that he could, mm. he definitely starts making and he stops judging people. Mm. Like, you know, at the start, he pretty much makes a judgment about Elizabeth in, yeah. you know, without even speaking to her. And, and I think it was the fact, because he made a judgment about um, not just Elizabeth, but the entire Bennett family. Yes, and about he made an incorrect in judgment in about what Jane yes. was capable of. And also he was prejudiced about status. Yeah. And that changes because eventually when he meets Elizabeth's uncle and aunt, mm. who actually are not even landed gentry, they're like, you know, they're 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 businessmen. Mm. He does not judge them. And no. and you know, his actions, the way he treats them doesn't change based on where he sees them standing on the social hierarchy. Yes. He judges them on their behavior mm. and he finds them respectable uh, yeah. and he gives them the respect. Because they ha behave very respectably and very generously. Yes. Insofar as paying the dowry for poor old Lydia. Lydia. No, uh, uh, yeah, they do. But I think that was, wasn't it Mr... Uh, uh, it was Mr. It, it was Mr. It was Darcy what? who insists on paying it. Yeah, uh, uh, even they were willing to pay. Yeah, her uh, Lydia's uh, sorry, Elizabeth's uncle and aunt. But I think it was, was Mr. It Darcy. Darcy. It? Yes, well, he basically read, he just awesome. underwrites it all. So right. you know, because he was trying to impress Lizzie. So. Ah, well, something's never changed. Something's no, never, changed. never changed. These days, you don't have to actually pay for anything. You just have to post <laughs> a picture on Instagram. Uh, you know, leaning against a Lamborghini or something and pretending. So. But, yeah. um, no, uh, but, uh, but I don't think that he was trying to impress her. He, he was trying to impress her through his actions mm. that, you know, that he, he solved the problem for her, yeah. that his competency, yeah. maybe that is what it was. It wasn't just him trying to say that, uh, you know, well, that I have cheap. money. Talk yeah. is cheap, but that's, I guess, going back to the... Because we, he, he yeah. also insists that his uncle and aunt don't tell Elizabeth. Yeah, that's true. So you know he was trying to uh, trying to help Lizzie, yeah. and hoping that somehow that can change the circumstances of his relationship. Yeah. But uh, again, just to go back to my earlier point, these days uh, to be seen to be doing the it's it's, it's much more superficial. Um, do you think that's what we've lost? That sense of authenticity. Do you think it's harder today to get to know somebody in the way these characters? I mean, these characters really got to know each other very very well. Before they even thought, well, they thought about getting married from the get-go. But before they got married, but the courtship was was hmm. was shorter. Hmm. Is that something we've lost? That we're too superficial, and we don't take time to think about these things more. I think sometimes we end up thinking about it for too long. Yeah. So no, I I, I wouldn't agree with so that. So we overthink it. 
I think we overthink it. Yes, mm. I think we overthink it. Mm. Whereas I think that they were going a lot more by their instincts, right. and and but their instincts weren't just about how I feel about this person, but her their instincts were: is this a good person? Yeah. And the intuition about whether it was a good match. Too. Well, yes, whether it was a good match or not. Yeah. So, I mean, if uh, if we look at Elizabeth and Darcy, and we look at them as you know the couple that the successful couple, because there are, there's a lot of coupling happening around them. Yeah. You know, so if it didn't really like maths. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of yeah, exactly. So um, there's a lot. Of, so if we look at them as a well-matched pair, as a successful pair, yeah. then um, you know, I mean. Yes, whether they instinctively like each other, and you know that 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 spark, as we say, yeah. the spark is there, but that is not the only thing that's defining their relationship. Mm. It really, it, it it really does go down to how they think, and and like I said, how they face challenges. So we put this book on our list of things for young people to read. Um, a closing thought: Why should not just young people, but why should people read this book? In in two hundred years later, why is it important? We have lost this idea about, you know, that life is about good judgment. Mm. Yeah. You know, and that and that judge and character, mm. and that good judgment and character is what makes a good life partner. Mm. But but you know and. But also, like it, it still requires romance. Yeah. So I mean, definitely, I think that romance, um, good judgment, and character—these are the things that matter mm. when you're, if you're looking for a successful relationship. Yeah. And and, and I think and, it, it. And the brings, genius of the book is, I suppose, the discussion of these things and where they fit together. Yes. How important they are. How important they are, and it really meditates on it. Yeah. It literally meditates on it. Yeah. So, and I think that this is a question that you know, even two hundred years from now, five hundred years from now, thousand years from now, men and women will still be considering. Well, if we still have men and women a thousand years from now, but that's another discussion. <laughs> on that note, uh, thank you everybody for joining. Thank you everybody for tuning in. If you haven't read Pride and Prejudice already read that book it's uh it, there's a reason why it's such an enduring classic 200 plus years later and you chitna thank you so much for joining us it was a great discussion no thank you thank you for having me